Okay, so now we're going to talk about how to uh, calculate the market premium. Okay? Then we'll talk about beta, but it'll take a couple, it will take a few classes to talk about these two things, because they're important. Okay? So, first of all, if we want, how would you measure the riskiness of the market portfolio? Does anyone have any idea? How do you think we can measure how risky the market portfolio is? Yes, but do you think it's practical to take every investment in the world for the calculation? Or not practical? Do we need to do that? Do we really need to take every investment in the world? No, so what can we do instead? We can use an index. Right, an index is a group of stocks or investments, right? So commonly used in the US is the S&P 500, okay? Top 500 companies in the US for US investors. So let's start with that, okay? S&P 500. <coughs> what companies are in the S&P 500? Tell me some names. Microsoft. GM. Hmm? McDonald's. Okay. Here we can see all the companies. We can see industry. Okay, it's good to know this vocabulary in English, right? Consumer, this is industry. Consumer discretionary, okay? Sub-industry, automotive, internet, specialty stores, computer and electronic, okay? So it's good to know that vocabulary in English. How are consumer discretionary, what does that mean? You can see that on the business news. What does it mean, discretionary? What does discretionary mean? If something is discretionary, do I have to do it or is it a choice? It's a choice. Discretionary means I have a choice. Do I have to buy an automobile? No, I don't. Okay? So I'm a consumer and I choose to buy these things. Okay? So consumer discretionary is a big class. And then under we have the sub-industry. Automobile, clothes, cable TV, restaurants. Okay? So, we can actually look at the sub-industry, right? Advertising, aerospace, okay? Airlines, apparel, do you know the Gap, Foot Locker? Yes. Boeing, American Airlines, uh, application software, Adobe, do you know Adobe? Yes. Asset management, we just talked about, BlackRock, right? Banks, Bank of America, Biotechnology, Broadcasting, CBS, Time Warner, Walt Disney, Walt Disney, okay, building, computers. So we can see that it's very diversified, okay? Different industries, different companies, right? How many different industries do we have? So many different industries, okay? Is that diversified? Yes. What about real estate, right? We could invest in construction companies. If we invest in real estate, uh, we, here's a lot of REITs. Do you understand REITs? Real estate investment trust. So it means that you don't have to buy a house to invest in real estate. Okay? You buy this investment trust. Are you listening? You buy. You can buy a part of this investment trust. This investment fund goes out and buys properties and rents the properties out to people. People put their money together. This one goes out and buys the property and rents out to people. Okay? So you can invest here. It's like investing in real estate. It's more or less the same thing. So the point I'm trying to make is that by investing in the S&P 500, okay, it's kind of like the market portfolio. What about gold? Right? There's, there may be some mining. There's oil, we invest in oil, oil and gas services, okay? Minerals, mining, okay, mining and gold, 
companies are included here too. Okay, so the S&P 500 we're going to use in the US, okay? A lot of these companies, <coughs> the S&P 500 is different than the Cosby. Because in the Cosby, uh, they're not all global companies, okay? There are some global companies like Samsung and LG. But in the S&P 500, we have many global companies here, okay? So, if we want to get a better index, we would use the Morgan Stanley World Index, Global Index, with thousands of companies in the world, right? That might be better. Just for the moment, we're going to concentrate on the S&P 500. So, then what are we going to do next? So, we've decided for the market portfolio, we're going to use this index, the S&P 500, this list of 500 companies, okay? So how are we going to find out what is the riskiness of the S&P 500? Hmm. How can we find a number, a percentage? We want to change it into a percentage. <coughs> this is the S&P 500 since 1960. Did you want to invest in the S&P 500 in 1960? It was just 54 points. Now it's 2,000 points. Which was better, to leave your money in cash or invest in the S&P 500 in 1960? If you had $50, $60, you could have invested in stock, you would now have $2,000, right? But if you just left in cash, you would just have $50. Just made a hole in the ground, okay? So how can we put a number on this? This is the expected return for the S&P 500 on a yearly basis. How would you put a number on this? What percent do you think? What percent return did this person get between here and here? How would you calculate that? How risky is the S&P 500? Or the return we expect to get on the S&P 500? What do you expect? Do you expect the S&P 500 over the next 50 years to go up or go down? Go oh, up. Why? Why do you think it will go up over the next 50 years? Hmm? The economy will develop. The companies will get more productive. Any other reasons? So you're forward looking, right? Some people might look at the past and say, well, in the past, the stock market went up, was always going up, right? So it's going to do that again in the future. So we have different ways, of, those are the two main ways of looking at expected returns, right? We have the forward-looking way or the historical-looking way, okay? What about this? This is the Nikkei index in Japan, Nikkei 225, 225 companies in Japan. It, would you prefer to invest your money in cash or in stocks in the Nikkei? Cash. In cash, right? So the Nikkei is one example, is a rare example in the world of a stock market which is actually lower than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Okay, just to show that's a possibility. Okay? So, Japan had a big bubble in the late 80s. Okay? If you invested, especially in the bubble, even if you invested here, your money is still going to be lower today than it was 30 years ago. Okay? What about the cost fee? What do you think? Korean index. Hmm? So most, most countries in the world look like the US, right? They look like US or Korea, right? The stock market is going up over the long term, right? Japan has just had some deflation problem, okay? And made some mistakes, but still has a high standard of living in Japan. So, what we're talking about here with this is what's going to happen, to, what's our expected return on the S&P 500 for next year? That's what we want to find, okay? Do you understand? So you said we can look at the future. What profits do we expect the companies to make in the future? Okay? Or we can look at the past. How much did it go up in the past? Which do you prefer? Looking at how much it went up in the past or looking at 
how you think the companies will do in the future. You prefer the future? Forward looking one? Okay. So, we're going to talk about the risk premium, right? So the risk premium is the premium that investors demand for investing in an average risk investment relative to the risk-free rate. So our average risk investment is the S&P 500. So S&P 500 compared to US government bonds. Okay? How much more? We, we know that the S&P 500 is more risky. Okay? If both of them give me 5% return, which am I going to invest in? US government bonds or S&P 500? Government bonds, of course, right? The S&P 500 can go down. Government bonds doesn't go down, right? So I should get some premium. I have to get an extra money offered if I'm going to invest in the S&P 500. So the premium has to be greater than zero, okay? It increases with the risk aversion of the investors in the market. So if we're in a crisis time, I'm going to need an even higher premium to invest in the S&P 500 compared to government bonds, okay? and it increase with the riskiness of the average investment. So, discuss with your partner. What is your risk premium? Assume that stocks are the only risky asset and you have two options. A riskless investment, the US government bond, you can make 5%. A mutual fund of all stocks, let's say the S&P 500, and the returns are uncertain. How much of an expected return would you demand to shift your money from the government bond, you can get 5% in the government bond, okay? And then you have to change your money to the S&P 500. So the question is, how much extra, how much extra do I need to offer you to change your money from the government bonds to the S&P 500? So discuss with your partner. Less than five, more than 13. How much extra money do you want? How much extra return do you want to change, take your money out of government bonds and put them into the S&P 500 companies? Shift means move or change. So you're changing your money from the government bond, risk and asset, to the fund. How much do you need? Extra. Okay, so let's have a show of hands. Who says A, less than 5%? Okay, who says B, between 5 and 7%? Who says C, between 7 and 9%? This is extra, right? So total is 12%. Between 9 and 11%? Between 11 and 13%? More than 13%? Okay, not a lot of people put up their hands, so let's try again. Okay, A, less than 5%. Extra. Just one person. B, between 5 and 7%. Okay, just about 6 people. C, between 7 and 9%. With more people. Between 9 and 11%. Okay, so the most one is between 7 and 9%. Okay, so you need an extra 7 or 9%. That's your risk premium. Okay, everybody has their own idea. But we're going to calculate, not for you, for the marginal investor, okay? So, if this was the entire market, the risk premium would be a weighted average of the risk premiums demanded by each and every investor. So if you guys represent the entire market, I could find the average of all your risk premiums, okay? Uh, but if you're a bigger investor, your risk aversion counts more than me. For example, Warren Buffet, 
his idea of the risk premium is more important than yours or mine, because he has a lot of money invested in the market. As investors become more risk averse, we expect the premium to increase. Okay, so go back to the previous example. You are now making the same choice, but you are making it in the aftermath of a stock market crash. The stock market has been gone down 25%. The S&P 500 went down 25% in the last month. Okay? Would you change your answer or not? I would demand a higher premium, smaller premium, or the same premium. Discuss with your partner. So are you going to change your mind? There was, I tell you, the S&P 500 has gone down 25% in the last month. Okay? Are you going to keep the same answer or want a higher premium? To change your money from bonds to stocks. Okay, let's see. Hands up A. Who wants a larger premium? Can it be higher than 30%? Yes. Okay, B. Who would want a smaller premium? Why do you want a smaller premium? The stock has gone down, you think it might go up again? Right? Might be the case. You think, oh, it's gone down 25%, so it must come back up again. Right? Some people might think like that. Okay? And see who would demand the same one? Doesn't matter. Okay? So we can all <coughs> give any answer here. Okay? But the point is, most people are going to answer A, psychologically. Okay? If investors are more, if the stock market is going down and the economy is not going well, People are risk off. We talked about risk off or risk adverse. Just because most people are like that doesn't mean it's right though, right? It's like psychological. We talked about before psychology in financial markets. It doesn't mean it's right, okay? But it's psychological factor, okay? Risk off and risk adverse. Actually, you, they might be right, right? If, when the, if the stock market goes down a lot, it might be the best time to buy, right? But if investors are risk off or risk adverse, the premium is going to get higher. Okay? Because people are going to say, oh no, it went down 25% last month, I'm, I don't want to invest in stocks. Okay? Stocks are too risky now. So, I'm going to not change my money from bonds. I'm going to keep it in bonds. Okay? So, <coughs> being risk on or risk off, we can often hear on the Bloomberg. Do you ever watch Bloomberg on the TV? They say, oh, today investors are risk off. It means they don't want to take risk. They're selling their stocks and buying bonds. Okay? So, we said that these are the ways we can estimate. We can use the historical data. We can estimate it from the dividends and today's stock prices. And the last one we didn't mention is just a small one. We can survey investors, like I asked you. Okay? We can ask investors, what's your risk premium? So those are the three ways we can find risk premium. Uh, we are going to suggest using some combination of the two of these, okay? But this one is the most widely used. Historical data is more widely used one, okay? So we'll start with that one, most widely used. The, so the historical data approach uh, is the default approach, means the most used approach, used by most, to arrive at the premium. So. On your second assignment, you will be finding the cost of equity, the cost of debt, and the cost of equity for a company. Okay? So you will have to decide, will I use the historical premium or the implied premium? That's your decision. Okay? So, in most cases, we do this. We define, first we define the time period. For example, the US stock market has data from 1928. But we might say, I'm not interested in before the World War only after the World War, okay? Then we calculate the returns on the stock index during the period. So we see what was the average return every year, right? How much did it go up every year? Okay, then we calculate the average return on the US government bond, right? What was the return on the US government bond over the same period? And then we find the difference, okay? Which one do you think was higher looking at the graph? The return in, in reality, the return on this S&P 500 or the return on the U.S. government bonds? Which one was higher? S&P 500, right? But should that happen in theory? What should happen in theory? We already mentioned. 
what should happen is, if I invest in US bond in 1920, okay, for example, I invested in US bond in 1920, $1,000, okay? I invest in the S&P 500 in 1920, $1,000. Which one should have more money today, in theory? Which one should have more money? No, should be the same. The same, right? This one, the return is, say, average. We're going to find average. Let's say it's 4%, okay? Say so this one, the return is average is 8%, okay? Then you might say, oh, the S&P 500. But no, because the S&P 500 is higher risk. That can go also minus 8%, okay? Up 8% one year, minus 8% the next year. US government bonds, we know where it never changes. This is a higher number, but it can be negative. This is a positive number, but only positive, not negative, okay? So in theory, it should be the same, because risk matches returns. It just so happens, in practice, the S&P 500 has done better, okay? Than the US bonds, okay? And that's what we're calculating here. How much better did the S&P 500 do than the US government bonds a year, right? So we get the returns on the bonds, average, Returns on the stocks average. And then it's going to be different depending on the time period we use. Okay? So this approach has some limitations looking at the past. It assumes that the risk aversion of investors has not changed. So for example, we're taking data from 1950. Were investors the same as investors today? Right? That kind of problem. Okay? It assumes that the riskiness of the stock index has not changed in a systemic way across time. So it assumes that the S&P 500 is not a lot more risky today than it was in 1950. Okay? So, again, it probably has changed. So, <coughs> let's have a look at the data. So, if we take, uh, we have different ways of calculating the average. Arithmetic ones is for uh, short one years and geometric is for long time. So we're going to look at the geometric average. Okay? And then we have uh, bonds, 10 year US government bonds. Bills is just one year. One year government bonds. 10 year government bonds. So we're here. 10 year government bonds. Okay? So if we take, if we invested money in a US government bond in 1928, we would have got an average of 4.2% a year. Okay? Does everybody understand? Now, today, how much interest do we get on the US government bond? We checked on Bloomberg. What was it? What was the interest, the yield on the 10 year bond? You checked for your project when you did some homework. You found the yield on the US government bond 10 year. 1.79, right? But in the past, of course, the interest rates were higher. Okay? Historically, his interest rates were higher. So, if we just take the data from 1960 or 2002, we're going to find this is the average return since 2002, 1.71, similar to what we saw on Bloomberg. Okay? If we go back 40 years, it's going to be 2.93. If we go back nearly 100 years, it's going to be 4.2. Why? Interest rates were much higher in the past. Okay? Which one would you prefer to use here? Which number would you prefer to use? To give you a realistic idea about the... What do you think gives you a better idea here about the return you can make on the US government bonds? The last one. The last one, why? So you think there's some systematic, do you understand systematic? Yes. Systematic means the systems have changed, something has changed completely. So if, if we think there's a systematic change, the interest rates are not going to go back, do you think interest rates could go up to 4%, 5%, 8%? Right, if you think that that's a systematic change, then you're going to use this number, okay? But if you don't think it's a systematic change, and you think, well, it's possible the interest rates can go up again to what they were 50 years ago, then you might use the older number. But statistically, when we use statistics, have you studied statistics? When we use statistics, which is better? More data or less data? 
Less data is better? In statistics? What data is? What data we use? Statistics just likes more data. The more data points we have, the better, right? About that point. So, generally, we can go back as far as we can. So we might say here, reasonably, you know, make a reasonable, we could say, let's use since 1962, right? We have a lot of data, and it's not that old, so let's use this number, okay? But we need to be consistent. We always use the same risk-free rate. So, what about historical data for markets outside the US? Okay, it's available for much shorter time periods, especially in emerging markets and the stock markets. They don't have, some countries don't only started their stock market in the 80s or the 90s. Okay? So there's a big error because they're not that long. So we're going to see how can we find the uh, data for emerging economies that don't have much historical data using the historical way. So we already talked about the rating agencies who give a default risk on the country. So for example, India has a rating of BA2 from Moody's. And we find the default spread is 3%. Okay? So some analysts just add this default spread to come up with a risk premium for India. Okay? They use the historical premium for the US. So we saw uh, on the US we could have the stocks here. This was uh, bonds, right? And then this is stocks for the US. Stocks is uh, premium is 3.08. Okay, so stocks is making 3% more than bonds since 2002. Stocks was making 4% more than bonds since 1962. And stocks were making 6% more than bonds since 1928. Okay, so again, I know that after the war, the First World War, the Second World War, there was high growth in the US, after, especially after the Second World War, it was a high growth period, okay? So I might say, I'm going to start in, from 1962, not 1928, okay? Uh, or else I, I can start from here and say this is the premium. So, uh, <coughs> let's say that uh, we take the 3.88 as the pre risk premium for the US, for the S&P. Or P is risk premium for S&P. Okay, then we just add on the 3% for India. Okay. Then we get, this is the risk premium for the Indian stock market would be 6.88%. Okay. Because the Indian stock market only has 20 years of data. That's not a lot. Okay? So we, we use the historical one for the US and we add on some risk premium for India. But actually that's a bit simple because this is only default risk. Okay? So we have, what we should do, we expect equity spreads to be higher than debt spreads. Okay? The equity market in India is going to be riskier than the debt market. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and calculate the difference. So we do that by looking at standard deviation. Standard deviation is the change, right? How much is it different from the average? So if we look at Brazil, we find the standard deviation in the Bovespa, which is the Brazilian like S&P, right, index, is 34%. And the standard deviation of their bonds is 21%. So which is riskier, the stocks or the bonds, compared to the standard deviation? Stock is 34% is changing, standard deviation is changing from the average. Okay, bonds is just 20% changing from the average. Okay, so uh, if in Brazil we have the default spread for the bonds is 2.5%, what we can do is we can make a ratio. Okay? Using the standard deviation of the stock market, 34% is the standard deviation of the stock market over 21.5% is the standard deviation of the bond market. So this will give us uh, 
at ratio, okay? And we can multiply this ratio by 2.5%. So I didn't write the ratio here, but this is about 3 over 2 is going to be about uh, 1.5, okay? And we multiply this by the risk premium for Brazil, and we're going to get 3.95%. So this is saying that we have this risk premium for bonds for Brazil, but the stock market is riskier than the bond market. How much riskier is the stock market than the bond market? 1.5 times riskier, 150% times riskier, okay? So we take our default spread for the bond, and we multiply by 1.5 to get, to get another number, 3.95. And that is going to be the risk premium for the Brazilian stock market, plus the risk premium for the US stock market is going to be equal to 7.83%. So this will be the risk premium for investing in Brazilian stock index. So let's go over that again. Okay, step one. Estimate an equity risk premium for a mature market like the US. Okay? Step two, come up with a generic and measurable definition of any mature market. So AAA rated country is mature, like Germany or the US. Step three, estimate the additional risk premium you will charge for markets that are not mature. So we can use the, this, the scaled up default spread. Okay? We scale up, we use the default spread, and we scale it up for the extra risk in the equity market. Make it bigger, okay? And then we end up with this kind of a table. This tells us country risk premiums for different countries, okay? So for example, Greece, it's going to be 10.5%, plus, uh, let's say the US one is around 5.88%, it's going to total 16, okay? So we can, we can make this kind of a premium for all the different countries. Okay. By looking at the standard deviation of their stock market and their bond market and their default spread and making the calculation. Then we get all of the different markets. Come AAA rated countries, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, they're going to be the same as the US, right? No difference. Other countries are going to have some extra risk. We can see Korea here is just a small bit of extra risk. 1%, just 1% more than the US stock market, okay? If we look at the COSPI, we might see that, that kind of situation. So, what about estimating this for a company? So we, we don't look at where the company is incorporated, we look at where the company is doing their operations. Okay? So for example, a company like Coca-Cola, this is its revenue breakdown. Where does Coca-Cola get its money from? What, what areas of the world? Where is the main place it gets its money, Coca-Cola? North America. Mexicans drink a lot of Coca-Cola, did you know that? A lot of Mexicans drink two liters of Coca-Cola a day. Go to the supermarket, it's all stocked with Coca-Cola. Do they drink a lot of Coca-Cola in the Philippines? Yes? So North America. So if we are calculating the equity risk premium for Coca-Cola, are we going to use just the US one? No, you're shaking your head, that's correct. Why, why not? Why are we not going to use the US risk premium for Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola is a US company. What does it get in different countries? Profits and revenues. You understand revenues? Sales. So what will happen to Coca-Cola if there's a crisis in Western Europe? There's a war between Germany and France. What will happen to Coca-Cola? They lose a lot of revenues, right? The company will be affected. So we can't just use the US data. Do you understand? We can't just make a US equity risk premium for Coca-Cola. So the important thing is not where the company is located. The important thing is where is the company getting its revenues? Okay? So you'll be doing the same thing. 
<coughs> you're going to choose a company, let's say you choose Coca-Cola, okay? You're going, in your second assignment, you have to find a cost of equity for Coca-Cola. You can't just use the US risk premium. You're going to have to use this table, okay? If you, some student asked me, what, what's the risk premium for Western Europe? Do I have to add all the countries together? No, it's already done here. Western Europe, 1.05%. Okay, Eastern Europe, another whatever, okay? So you have to find, you will have to find for your company, where does it get its revenues, okay? What countries does it get its revenues in? Make a risk premium, so how do we do that? We write down the percent of our premium in each country, it's weighted average, okay? We learned how to do weighted average is important in week two or three. Very often use weighted average in finance. Okay, that's why I was telling you that you, should, you need to make sure to do the weighted average. Okay, so I can see some students are using their smartphones at the back of the class. Can you put away your smartphones, please? There are two or three students who are using their smartphones at the back of the class. Hello? Can you put away your smartphone, please? Student at the back of the class. Hello? Yes, can you put away your smartphone, please? Put it in your bag, please. Okay, you need to pay attention. You're going to be doing this on your second assignment. If you don't listen now, you're going to find it hard to do your second assignment, okay? So, we get the revenue of each country. We find this information on Google. Google, Coca-Cola, revenues breakdown by country. Or I'll give you directions about some financial statement you can find it in. Okay? Make a table like this. Where do they get their revenue? Then write down the ERP for the country. Okay? How risky is the country where they get the revenue? Which is the riskiest country for Coca-Cola? Latin America and Africa, right? Okay, so anyway, they're just doing small business in Africa, okay? So then we just multiply the percentage by this. 19 multiplied by 6.67 gives 0 0.67. We multiply each percentage by the number, and then we add them together, and we get the weighted average, okay? So Coca-Cola's total uh, one is going to be 7.14, okay? So 7.14 is the weighted average of all of the total ERPs, or we can find the country risk premium, 1.14, and add that to the US one, 6. 6 plus 1.14 is 7.14. So that's how we do that. Do you have any questions about that? You're going to choose a global company. Nobody is going to choose a company which only gets the revenues from the US. Okay? So you're going to have to find where does the company get the revenue. It would be easier for you if the company gets a lot of its revenues in the US or just US and Western Europe, right? Uh, but if the company gets a lot of its revenue from, for example, Africa or Latin America, it's going to be a riskier company. Does that make sense? There's more political and economic and other types of risk in those countries. You have companies that are based in the US, they might do no business in the US, hardly any business in the US, and a lot of their business in Africa. For example, mining. Do you understand mining? Yes. Mining company, they might have no mines in the US, they do all of their business and get a lot of their revenues from Africa or Latin America. So it depends on your company. So, equity risk premium, is based on company, where does the company get its revenues, not on where is the company located. Okay, so let's try one exercise to practice. Okay, so you have this data. Okay, uh, the standard deviation in the Indian, Sensex is the Indian S&P 500, right? That's 32%. Bond, government bond standard deviation is here. Default spread based on rating. Country risk premium, default spread multiplied by standard deviation and equity over standard deviation and bond equals a total risk premium for India. Okay, so do the calculation. 
we can see the equation here. If you look on your book, in your book on page 48, we have the two equations in the middle of the page. On 48, okay? Equity risk premium is risk premium for US market plus country risk premium. And here, uh, country risk premium equals country bond default spread multiplied by the RSD for the country. Okay? RSD for the country is standard deviation of the country's equity over standard deviation of the country's bonds. We can see an example on the next page, on page 49. Okay? So try and do the calculation. On page 49 we see the example for Korea instead of India. You can follow that example. So did anybody find the answer? 8.38. Okay, so how did you do that? We just followed this equation, right? The default spread. So the default spread is 3% three, three multiplied by the standard deviation on equity, 32 over 21.3. Okay? What is the answer? To this, 32 over 21.3 is equals to 1.5. So we get 3% multiplied by 1.5. Okay, equals 4.5. And that is going to be called the country risk premium. Do you understand country risk premium? Country, risk, <coughs> premium. Premium means extra. How much extra is the risk in India compared to the United States? 4.5%. So we need to add this to the risk for the United States. 
and we get the total risk premium, okay? That is 8.38%, uh, okay? <coughs> so, that's a historical way to calculate. Do you have any questions about the historical calculation? No? Do you know how to calculate average returns on the stock index? You know how to calculate returns? We looked at the average returns. Stock price 1 plus my, minus stock price 2 over, or sorry, stock price 0. Stock price 1 minus stock price 0 over stock price 0, right? So it's the same for bonds. We can add in dividends. So we said here that, I'm just explaining, we calculated all the returns, the historical returns, right? So we did that. We get the stock price 1 is 45, stock price 0 is 40. So we get 45 minus 40 over 40, 5 over 40, 5 over 40 is 12%, right? So that means last year we made a return of 12%. Do you understand? Okay, on bonds it's the same. Bond price 1 minus bond price 0 over. Okay, what return did we make? Okay, so that's how we calculate the historical returns. We find the average of the historical return. And this tells us how much extra we should ask to invest in stocks compared to bonds. Do you have any question about the historical, historical premium? No? Okay then, so then let's finish there for today. So enjoy the weekend. Okay? Why are you laughing? It's nice weather. And have a nice weekend, right?